Hello and welcome to episode 33 of the Ask Historians podcast. So today we have a very special guest. That guest is me. So I will be taking a bit of a turn from uh, being on this side of the microphone, being the interviewer, to being the interviewee. So Mike Jaffs, who is the other uh, co-host and kind of background producer and manager of the Ask Historians YouTube page, where we're putting up the, the old episodes of the, the podcast with some very nice electrical menus and graphics. So uh, actually, really do go check out the YouTube page. It's, it's, it's going to be great. It's a project in the making. But uh, so anyway, Mike will be interviewing me about uh, the intention was to focus on the 1473 civil war between Tenochtitlan and Tlatelolco. But we, we got a little distracted by the, the backstory, by the history of it, you might say. So what ended up being uh, this episode is kind of a crash course in Aztec history, focusing on these two groups. Uh, you know, Tenochtitlan, of course, the, the major city that people think about when they think about the Aztecs, and Tlatelolco was its sister city, uh, which it conquered in 1473, which is kind of how we culminate this podcast. But uh, as, we, as we go into this, as we kind of build up the backstory about why these two cities had these kind of different trajectories, so we start from talking about really the, the very origins of the Mexica people, uh, the, the founding of both of the cities, moving in through their domination by the Tepanex, uh, their eventual independence, and then uh, the, this growing split that happens underneath the rule of Ashiakat and Moquiwish of the two respective cities, finally culminating with these a series of, uh, of basically triggering events that lead to this, this war. So uh, I hope you enjoy it. I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up because, again, you're going to be hearing a lot of my voice for the next uh, you know, hour or so. Uh, but I hope you enjoy. Welcome to the Ask Historians podcast. Hey, welcome to the Ask Historians podcast. I am your host, 400 Rabbits. Oh, wait. Oh, I'm not. I'm Jasvis. You may recognize me from a previous episode, but today we are actually interviewing 400 Rabbits, and you may very well know him. Uh, he did a previous podcast with us long, long ago, but I want to give him the chance to really expound upon some more of the things he's really specialized in. So, Rabbits, welcome to the Ask Historians podcast. Hello. It's it's interesting to be on the side of the uh, the mic here. Just to let everybody know that uh, I will still be the host mostly, but uh, you know, Mike is going to be helping me out kind of with a lot of kind of the behind the scenes stuff. But as to your question, yeah. So in the past, uh, when I did my kind of Aztec uh, Spanish conquest episode with Taz way back at like episode three or four, I think it was my first two parter, ages ago, and and when the podcast was still just as I go. Uh, you know, he had asked me, you know, so what got you into Aztec history? And I, I had said, well, I studied anthropology in undergrad. Um, and while I wasn't necessarily an archaeologist, um, I, part of what I did, uh, and my archaeology professor was, was a Mayanist. So I got exposed to a lot of kind of, you know, my archaeology, my archaeology training was uh, very geared toward Mesoamerica. But, you know, everybody studies the Maya, you know, the Maya that's so, you know, they're, they think they're so special. The Aztecs were kind of this thing that had been overshadowed by the Maya since they had this whole kind of, um, you know, the Maya have this written script that we can go back and they're, you know, they're people, they're featured in many um, um, completely real documentaries about aliens. So, you know, I looked at the Aztecs and they really do have this kind of written textual history that is not quite the same uh, as the, the Maya. The Maya are writing in their own digital script, uh, monumental uh, artifacts and sculptures and things like that. It, meanwhile, a lot of what we have uh, for the Aztecs, but all of what we have for the Aztecs are kind of uh, post-conquest, actual written documents. There aren't really, uh, I mean, there are a few kind of pre-conquest codices that hang out uh, that uh, are still around, but they're, they're kind of very general. They're not like about like specific historical things or about like uh, you know, astronomy and religion and mythology and things like that. So I guess what I'm saying to bring this around to, to an actual point is that I wanted to um, study uh, kind of a Mesoamerican group that I felt was uh, not quite so much the limelight, uh, being you know, kind of the hipster historian that I am. Uh, but also uh, in studying that, I really was exposed to the fact that there is this tremendous, tremendous, tremendous amount of, histor of history to the Aztecs that really just gets completely ignored when we talk about them. I would say most people, when they think about the Aztecs, they basically think uh, they the only thing the only thing they think about is is the conquest. I, I can't talk, you know, I talked to Taz about that. It's like uh, you had to pick this topic. So 
I wanted to come around and introduce the, the topic that we're covering today as a way of showing that, yes, the Aztecs do have this history besides dying of smallpox and being shot by cannons. Yeah, and when I think of the Aztecs, which is a, a name you've thrown around quite a few times in that spiel, I think of either human sacrifice or I think of maybe that Mel Gibson movie, but what what exactly is an Aztec? What is what is the name of Aztec? Because I know there are many names that get thrown around in the subject. There's Nahua, there's Mexica, but what is what is Aztec specifically referring to? Yeah, um, that's actually a really good question. In fact, it's going to be uh, really very, 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 very important to what we talk about today because we're not just going to be talking about one particular subgroup of the Aztecs. Uh, we're going to be talking about kind of subgroups within that subgroups. Uh, in kind of, and I, I guess I should say that the topic we're covering today, since you kind of landed over it, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, the Tenochtitlan Tlatelolco War. Um, which could almost mm. be seen as a civil war between the Mexica. And so to go back to your question, uh, the term Aztec is not really a term that was used in Mesoamerica uh, during this time period, which is the, the post-classic. So about like 900 AD till you know, uh, the Spanish showed up and just ruined everything. But, <laughs> <laughs> but the term Aztec is something that really came about in kind of the 19th century, starting to be kind of backwards applied to this uh, particular subset of Nahua groups. So Nahua being this kind of greater overarching ethnicity of people who speak Nahuatl. Mm. And that's the, the the language that uh, most people say Nahuatl, but it's it's more right. kind of Nahuatl because <laughs> it's, uh, it's a lateral voiceless alveolar fricative, uh, fricative. So more like, you know, Nahuatl. Or something like that. I'm not a native speaker. I'm not going to p pretend to know that I'm going to give 100% absolute great pronunciations throughout this, but I, I, I will go closer than <laughs> as close I, as I, I can. guarantee you. You nobody will know except for a few people. <laughs> you will certainly be doing better than me at this. So yeah, I can do just, not worry. Uh, yeah, I can just picture you know some of our other uh, Mesoamerican experts on on ask historians being like, oh, are you saying it like that? Oh, I'm ashamed of you. But there will um, be some very angry not long lobbies <laughs> yes, coming yeah. out. Very angry. Uh, so. The term, uh, so we have these Nahua groups uh, spread throughout uh, central, central Mexico, uh, going all the way down into kind of uh, Central America as well, and related language groups going all the way up into the southwest of the, you know, what's now the United States. But really what we're talking about when we say Aztecs are three particular Nahua groups. In particular, three groups that are associated with three alphabet, with an, an alphabet, um, is just kind of a Nahua term for a, a, a city-state might be good, a polity. Mm. And for those of you with classical educations, a, a polis or a polis. I don't have a classical education, so I'm not going to try to pronounce that either. But So um, it's centered around an actual metropolitan, metropolitan center or city or something like that? Yeah, yeah. So what we're talking about when we say the Aztecs or the Aztec Empire, we're really, which is really the Aztec Triple Alliance, uh, so we have the Ecola, that's the, 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 the Nahua group at, at Texcoco, that's their city. Uh, and then we have the Mexica at Tenochtitlan. And, and that's really what most people think about when they think about the Aztecs. They think about, well, they, they, they think about the Mexica. And that's the group we most, most, most associate with the Aztecs simply because when it comes down to it, they were the most dominant group by far when the Spanish showed up. But the reason they're called uh, the reason they are called you know the Aztecs is because this goes back to a common origin myth that uh, a lot of these Nahua groups had, you know, including these three groups we just talked about, but also groups, um, other groups inside the Valley of Mexico, and also other groups outside the Valley of Mexico. Um, so, for instance, the Tlaxcalans over in you know the Valley of uh, Puebla and all in that area would also be considered Aztecs because they share this common origin myth of coming from this kind of semi-mythical land called Atzlan. So Atzlan simply uh, so Aztec means someone who is from Atzlan. So so you mentioned you mentioned the Mexica being the more prominent of that triple alliance that you're talking about. But what what exactly what exactly is their position within there? Why are they the most prominent? What is their kind of history within this group? If I tell people the one thing to keep in mind about Aztec history is that no one ever liked the Mexica, including the Mexica. Um, they, they, they really, their entire history is almost kind of um, uh, starting from nothing and coming up from having a chip on your shoulder to being on top. Um, it's very yeah. good, fellas. So, 
<laughs> or Scarface. Just replace the mounds of cocaine with mounds of hearts that have been torn from bodies. So, exactly. um, which is, I guess that's, I guess that's better. Uh, so, <laughs> we need to keep in mind, and just kind of, and this is going to kind of set the scene for why we have this kind of Mexica civil war later. That the the Mexica came into the Valley of Mexico long after all these other uh, Nahua groups had already come in and, and been settled. So. In kind of the 13th century or so, we have the Mexica in this kind of semi-nomadic, on the edges of this, you know, more complex, settled uh, urban civilization coming into the Valley of Mexico, uh, where other Nama groups have been for, for some cases, for centuries. Uh, so all the land is pretty much claimed already. But the Mexica come in and they settle at a place called Chapultepec. And for those of you who know Mexico City, this is indeed where uh, Parque de Chapultepec is today. Mexico City is Tenochtitlan. It's just been kind of built over and grown over from, you know, like the 200,000 people that it was in, you know, 1520 to the however tens of millions there are today. <laughs> um, it's a big city. Certainly, certainly. So when does when does this actually turn into Tenochtitlan that we think of? for the Aztecs. What is the process of this from settling to Tenochtitlan? Again, you know, it, it is this story of tragedy, um, kind of almost self-inflicted and being the underdog the entire way. So uh, the Mexica settled Chapultepec, but even by some of their own accounts in their own histories, uh, they're kind of a disruptive force. Uh, if you read between the lines, you kind of think of them as being this kind of like bandit group that came in and just started raiding everybody else. So uh, a coalition of groups got together and then kicked them out of Chapultepec. And at this point, there's the mythical story of one of the people who had come to kick them out. His heart was torn out and thrown into the lake. That'll come important later. Uh, so the Mexica, they, they're, they're driven, they're, their leader is killed, they're driven from Chapultepec, and they hide amongst the, the reeds and the marshes of Lake Texcoco. So uh, another thing to keep in mind, and I'll put up like a map uh, when we actually do the, the discussion post for this, but uh, keep in mind that Mexico City used to be um, or what is now Mexico City used to be basically a lake system, um, but it was a very shallow lake system in many parts. So uh, and it's almost kind of a lakey, marshy area. So you, you'll see this theme repeated over and over again in kind of a literary trope that if you want to show uh, people being defeated, you show them hiding out in the marshes amongst the reeds and the ducks, uh, which is what happens during Mexica here. Yeah. But they're taken in by another group that the city of the Kula people, another Yanawa group at the city of Kulakan. We have this fabled history of tying back into the Toltecs or this kind of progenitor city for civilization. And the, the cool would take them in and say, okay, yeah, you can stay here. We'll take you in, but you're not, you're definitely not equals. You can settle in this place called Dezaapan, which is famous for being filled with snakes. Um, <laughs> Quite the deal. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, and in some versions of the origin myth, it's said that the, the cool was, figured that, okay, well, let the Mexica settle into Zalpan and then the snakes will all eat them. But what happens is that, you know, the, the cool will come back a few days later to expect them to find no more Mexica and they find that the Mexica have eaten all the snakes. So, <laughs> yeah, again, it's this kind of repetitive theme of like, you know, you throw the worst you can at us and we'll turn it into something great. Quite resilient, in, yeah. in other words. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, again, it is it is a uh, it is a ethnic history of, of being hard-nosed and not letting anything get you down. So the Mexica settle in pretty well with the cool after some years, and there's some intermingling and intermarriaging. And the Mexica go to the, the ruler of, of Kula Khan at the time, a guy named Kosh Koshli, and say, hey, we would like uh, one of your daughters. And political marriages uh, are a huge theme throughout Mesoamerican history. If you want to form a bond with someone, um, the way to do it is to have them you know, marry one of your daughters or you marry one of their daughters. You, we can see this again and again in kind of like the uh, Spanish accounts where Cortez will show up at a, at a city uh, and the leader of that city will be like, oh, hey, great. You know, oh, we're forming alliance. Well, take my daughter with you, you know, or take, you know, this relative of mine with me or something like that. So women mm -hmm. being used as kind of these political pawns, which I guess is kind of common theme throughout history. But in this case, though, there is a little bit of a misunderstanding. So, you know, we, you talked about human sacrifice before. And the one thing to keep in mind also, I, I said there's one thing to keep in mind like nine times. So the ninth thing to keep in mind is that the Mexica turned up human sacrifice to like 11. It, it was always a present theme throughout Mesoamerica, but it was also focused on kind of more on kind of elite captures and things like that. You know, you'd still have mm -hmm. sacrifices, but you wouldn't have something like the the, the dedication of the Temple of uh, Huitzilopochtli where a purported, you know, 80,000 prisoners were sacrificed. It, that number is inflated, just, just, you know, that probably didn't actually happen. 
So, <laughs> yeah, just think of the logistics for that for a second. It's quite fantastic. I imagine the cleanup after that would be quite something. <laughs> just, yeah, one guy with a mop. Um, <laughs> so, so the Mashika asked for this daughter uh, of the Kuwa leader. Uh, and he grants it, thinking this is probably going to be some sort of arranged marriage. And he's invited to a ceremony, which, of course, he was probably thinking, okay, this is the official wedding ceremony in the marriage. Um, whereupon he finds that a priest has sacrificed his daughter, flayed her skin off, and is wearing it. Uh, uh, Go ahead. Well, Go ahead. I know many people have questions at this point. So was this something that is not uncommon? Or was this a particularly brutal uh, instance of this? What, where does this kind of figure in with uh, the the history of these peoples? So yeah, this this is kind of an, uh, a recognized religious uh, ritual at the time, primarily associated with this one particular god called Shipitotek. In fact, there's um, the the festival of Shipitotek in kind of the, this Aztec calendar is in fact called the Feast of the Flayed Men, and you know part of the sacrifice is you know, ritually flaying the skin off prisoners and, and wearing them. So, it's very Game of Thrones like. <laughs> yeah. Uh, again, taking it up to eleven, but no, a shippy totek, the flaying a skin. This is something that it was not unknown. However, the fact that the cool wild leader saw, you know, his daughter who he thought was forming, a, you know, an alliance with these people, a little bit surprising. So once again, <laughs> the Mashika are driven out, hiding in the marshes amongst the ducks and the reeds. But in this time, this kind of pathetic refugee group settles on this one island that wasn't really claimed by anyone. It's in kind of the kind of hegemony area of, of the Tepanex, who are kind of the dominant group in the area. But it, it's kind of a, it's kind of an island out in the middle of the lake that nobody wants. Um, okay. And they settle there because, uh, remember that heart that got thrown into the middle of Lake Texcoco? Yes. The prophecy, the mythology was that from that heart would spring a nopal cactus upon which a, you know, an eagle would perch and eat a snake. And if that image sounds familiar to anyone, that's because it is the seal of Mexico and it's on the Mexican flag. So this is the kind of the founding myth of Mexico at this point right now. Uh, so the, the Mexica see this, uh, they travel to this island, they see the cactus with the eagle and the snake, and they say, we're home. Our, our, our god, Huitzilopochtli, has finally uh, led us to the land that he had promised us, and they settle down. Uh, and this is in the year Omicali, which is two house uh, in the indigenous numbering system. Um, in kind of the western numbering system, this would be 1325, uh, you know, common era. <laughs> so uh, so again, it, it's this idea also... Part of what fascinates me about Aztec history is that a lot of people think that they are this, you know, this group that stretched back in time and had centuries of history behind them. But really, we have about 200 years max of, you know, 200, 300 years max of, of Mexica history um, before the Spanish arrived. They're very much a latecomer group. Yeah, that's certainly a much later date than I would have typically placed on such events or such uprisings or upcomings, rather. So they, they, they go to this land and they start founding the city and is everything just okay from then on or what? <laughs> and then, yeah, it was nothing but cupcakes, nothing but cupcakes. <laughs> so, uh, n no, so, I mean, clearly, once again, this theme of no one ever liked Mashika, particularly the Mashika, there is fairly early on, and we don't really have any clear reasons why, but fairly early on, uh, this one group splits off from the newly founded city of Tenochtitlan to found their own city called Satoloco, basically on just a, another island. And these are tiny islands right next to each other. So it's just they, mm -hmm. they say, screw you guys, we're, we're taking our ball and going over here. And that's about uh, the founding date for that is usually like 1337, 1338, somewhere around there. Um, but there's, from some of the archaeological evidence that we have, it's kind of implied that there was already like an earlier, smaller settlement there. Um, so we don't know if the people who who left Tenochtitlan were simply going to go join this other group, or if they were going to conquer this other group, or if they just kind of intermarried and intermingled with this other group, or if they had been invited over. The histories tend to imply that this is an acrimonious split, but the histories themselves are colored by the fact of all that came later, what we're getting into, and particularly what we're getting into in, in our main story. This is all background at this point. But we don't we don't know. But we do know that there was a split of these groups. And this starts off this 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 branch of history which is going to lead us up into this civil war. Because these two groups actually ended up with very different trajectories. So if you recall, I said that um, this area was kind of nominally claimed by the Tepanex. 
And they were the dominant power of the region, particularly under this guy named Tezozomak, who was forming himself an empire. He's kind of a, a proto-Aztec empire. But at this time, he was basically going around the Valley of Mexico, um, conquering it. And at this point, uh, these two new cities, uh, Tenochtitlan and Tlatelolco, fall under his dominion. They're not in any place to challenge that, so they both become tributaries to the Tepanaks at Azcatzpoltzalco. This is really where we start to see this, this, this split here. So under, under, under that tributary system, obviously there was the initial split. And then what are, what are relations like between the two cities, these two groups under this tribute system? What changed between uh, before this tribute system and after? Was there any kind of reaction or any kind of uh, increased interaction between the two under the tribute system? Or was there kind of more loathing and competition? What, what is going on during this time? The area that we're talking about here is still very small, but these are still kind of burgeoning cities. But, you know, there's still constant interaction between these two people because, you know, they are still uh, both Mexica and always will be Mexica. Even if they identify themselves as Tenochka or the Tlatelolca as opposed to uh, simply Mexica. But what happens under this, this Tepanek dominance is that Tlatelolco quickly becomes kind of an economic powerhouse. In, in Tlatelolco today is, you know, known in history as for having, you know, the largest market in, in the Valley of Mexico. And uh, the, the Plaza de Tres, uh, Tres Culturas in uh, Mexico City is actually the old marketplace there. So it became well known for being this large market, this economic commercial powerhouse, trading links all over the place. Tenochtitlan, on the other hand, became known as basically the shock troopers, the vanguard of the Tepanak armies. I should point out now that a lot of what I'm saying you have to is tinged with mythology and kind of backwards looking because again, all of these histories that we have are being written 200 years, 100 years after this fact. Um, mm-hmm. So there is a bit of kind of uh, mythologizing about this and a bit of kind of saying like, well, of course it was like this from the beginning. When we can compare multiple sources, even for people who are not writing from a particular Mexica standpoint, and just compare the, the way that the history has played out, it, it, this does, it, essentially it makes sense and we can say, okay, you know, this may not be, the specifics may not be as precise and clear as we want, but the general idea that we're getting is something that we can kind of accept as um, following a basic plot outline. You know, the histories say that the, the Mexica uh, from Tenochtitlan were the ones who were going out and leading the first strikes on all these other cities around uh, the Valley of Mexico, in part because it was a little bit of revenge fantasy there, uh, while the Tlatelolco were building up these trade links all around uh, the area as well. So there, right there you have this uh, immediate kind of split uh, in basically the roles that these two Mexica groups are, are having. And this gets uh, exacerbated when they start electing a Tlatelani. So now, now this may be a term that you and I are both familiar <laughs> with intimately, but for everyone else, can can you explain what exactly is a uh, Tlatelani? Yeah, so uh, Tlatelani is a Nahuatl word that simply means speaker. Uh, it's usually translated um, some older texts as like directly as king. Um, or, you know, in more recent texts, it might just be translated as ruler. But uh, a Tlatelani is the ruler of Altapet. So uh, the king is the ruler of the city. And when we have this, it's this signifying that you are now kind of a grown up, can put on your big boy pants kind of settlement. So what happens is that, and, and it's a little confusing on who actually made this first move, whether it was the Tlatelolca who made the first move to elect a, a Tlatelani or whether it was the, the Tenochka, uh, Tenochtitlan, who made the first move to elect a Tlatelani. But what happens is that Tlatelolco goes to Tezozamak, this, this kind of proto-emperor of, of the Tepanaks, and says, we want you to give us a ruler. And he does. He, he grants them one of, one of his sons to rule over the city. So now we have this Tepanak dynasty being integrated into and ruling over Tlatelolco. Meanwhile, the Tenochka turned back to their old pals at Kublai who had you know, kicked them out over that tiny, tiny little misunderstanding, because there, not all the Mexica had been kicked out, and some who had kind of integrated into Kulakan were still there. And particularly this one person by the name of Akamapishli, who was of both uh, Mexica and Kulwa descent at this point. He had married into the, the Kulwa ruling family, was the person they turned to Kulakan and said, hey, we want you to come back and, and join us as this Kulwa Mexica person, and we want you to be our ruler. And in fact, uh, he did, and in fact, uh, every single ruler of Tenochtitlan descends from him directly. 
So, uh, you know, uh, Motekazuma, uh, Shokuyo, uh, you know, Montezuma, who was there when Cortez showed up, was the, 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 the great, great grandson of Akama Pishti. I'll have to go back and, and look through. But yeah, um, so we not only have these different roles, we also have these uh, kind of different lineages and identifications as well. So, and again, this is all underneath the Tepanaks, but when we think of the Aztecs, we don't think of them as subordinate to some group. So what do they eventually split off from the Tepanaks? Do the Tepanaks grant them any kind of independence? <laughs> or what, what ends up happening to this group in this there, relationship? There's very little granting of independence uh, in Mesoamerican <laughs> history. It's really, you know, because it is, it, it's what's called kind of a hegemonic empire in the fact that you are strong enough and intimidating enough to keep, you know, have people keep giving you tribute and, uh, you know, keep being subordinate to your foreign policy aims, then you're in charge. But what happens is that Tezozamot, this grand uh, ruler who had taken the Tepanaks from being just one group out of many to basically conquer the entire Valley of Mexico, he, he dies after a very long reign. And what happens then is that his chosen successor is then murdered by another one of his sons. And the, the son who, who, who murders this, this chosen son of his, uh, the, the murderous son's name is Mashla. And Mashla does not like uh, the Mashika, who have been gaining this kind of most favored subordinate status. And to, to drive this even more home, the son of Akamapishli married a daughter of Tezozomak. So, you know, cementing them into that, that Tepanak dynasty as well. So the Mashika mm. are not only this growing regional power, both in commercial and military might, but they're also dynastic rivals with him. Uh, so what Mashla does is he orders the assassination of the ruler of Tenochtitlan uh, and possibly even the ruler of Tlatelolco. Um, some of the sources say, yes, this happens. Some of the sources don't say anything about this. Mashla makes this power play and it sparks this civil war. This is actually the founding of the Aztec Triple Alliance, the, the Aztec Empire. So Tenochtitlan goes to another group, the, the Ecolwa Texcoco and ally with them through this is i'm i'm summing this up as quickly as possible this is entirely uh, another story but it's an it, interesting in its own right but essentially what happens is that uh, tenochtitlan allies with texcoco and another uh tepanac city uh tlacopan to form this triple alliance and tlatelolco kind of reluctantly kind of goes along remember they are much more tepanac identified so they don't quite jump on this bandwagon right away which is unfortunate for them because when this war of independence ends and the Tepanaks are overthrown and the Triple Alliance is now in charge, Tlatelolco is kind of outside that Triple Alliance. So when the Aztec Empire starts expanding, Tlatelolco certainly benefits. You know, they're right next door to Tenochtitlan. They are still the largest market in the area. Um, they get rich as well, but as these conquests go on and on and on and the Aztecs expand, Tenochtitlan is by far becoming the, the larger, more powerful, more dominant city. So just to backtrack for one second, when we talked about Tenochtitlan being formed in the, mid or in the mid 1300s, when is this happening in this timeline? Is it in the 200 years later? Is it uh, how long did it take them to finally uh, have this uh, civil war and break out from this tribute rule? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. It goes back to our idea about Aztec history being actually you know, surprisingly short. So this all occurred, this, this war against the Tepanaks for independence, occur, uh, occurred in kind of the late 1420s, early 1430s. Because of the way uh, that different dates have been calculated from the, the, the native calendar into uh, you know, the, the Western calendar, there's some fuzziness, and, and that is not helped by the fact that some sources will give different dates, and then some sources will say, like, oh, the war lasted a year, and other sources will say, oh, it lasted five years. But generally, yeah, so about 100 years after the founding of Tenochtitlan, we have Tenochtitlan finally become independent. And then 100 years after that, they become well, less independent once uh, the Spanish come in. So, uh, again, you have 100 years of subordination, 100 years of, of kind of the imperial Aztecs, and then you have the colonial period. So it's, it's actually a very compressed kind of timeline for this. Absolutely. Very, very short. So let's go back then to the, the Civil War and kind of the outcomes of it. You have the Aztec uh, rising up and this kind of this the Tepanaks are breaking apart. And how does this kind of resolve what's what's going on at the end here? And you mentioned also that there were some uh, not so great things to come out of the Tlatelolca 
kind of reluctance to enter this war? What it's, it's what, what not kind so of much that uh, bad things happen to the Tlatelolca. It's it's just that they missed out on um, getting a seat at the table, essentially. And so what happens is that, uh, as I mentioned, Tenochtitlan grows more and more powerful and more and more rich, and Tlatelolco also grows powerful and rich, but not near to the extent of Tenochtitlan. And this this is often kind of cited for for a lot of the sources when they talk about why this this Tenochtitlan Tlatelolco war actually occurred is that Tlatelolco was jealous of the Tenochtka. You know, they were jealous of their power. And the problem here is that a, a lot of our sources that we have are actually kind of slanted towards writing the Tenochtka as kind of the heroes of this historical tale. Uh, but even mm-hmm. in some sources that are kind of a little more objective or kind of a little more less invested, you know, or n- basically not written by Tenochtka themselves, um, <laughs> you you can see there, there there's idea of, of Tlatelolco maybe not being jealous of the power of Tenochtitlan, but perhaps being a bit apprehensive about what would happen, which, I mean, clearly, as as we, we shall see, was quite uh, you know, prescient of them. But or what, what I want to talk about now is, is actually this guy called Mokwiwish. So if we skip ahead to about uh, the 1460s, about that time, so we've had kind of a, a generation go by, and a lot of the people that helped establish this, early, you know, this triple alliance um, these you know, these leaders that were instrumental in putting it in place and forming this this alliance between these three cities, and also in having the, the Tenochtitlan Tlatelolco become kind of friends again, they're all they're passing away, they're dying. So so they're they're falling apart, and obviously then some political connections are falling apart. What what takes the place of these relationships as these older guard, these older leaders are are dying off. So in many cases, there there is still this, you know, a lot of, so all these cities have intermarried, <laughs> I mean, because that's how you do it. Uh, so mm-hmm. we are seeing this continuation, these familial bonds, but the kind of the, the gravitas of these, of this old guard is, is fading away. And these kind of new sets of leaders are rising up. And in particular, there's this one Fata Loco uh, ruler called Mokiwish. And Mokiwish, uh, he, he established his 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 reputation during this war in the 1460s where he was the leader of um, of the Tlatel, uh, the Tlatelolco group that went out and fought against this group called the the Totonax it's um if any of you uh know where um uh, what is Pico de Orizaba is right now uh, or the town of Orizaba um that was a town called uh Quihuilapan uh, uh, back at the time and it was kind of the gateway to the coast so this is a, this is a very important military campaign that uh, Mokuish uh, was leading the Tlatelolca uh, group, and then a Tenochka uh, a prince, I guess you could say, uh, he was the son of the rule at the time, by the name of uh, Ashia Katz, was leading the Tenochka group. Now, as this uh, as this war band, you know, army approaches uh, the Totonac lands, they learn that um, the Totonacs have gathered up a lot more allies than they had expected, and so Ashia Katz calls this. His conference of all the war leaders you know, and generals and says, um, we're very much outnumbered. It doesn't look like this is going to go well for us. I think we should probably fall back, regroup, and let's table this invasion. Let's let's table this for now. We'll come back to it later. But Mokuish stood up and, and basically said, you know, I'm I'm not intimidated. I'm not afraid. You know, I am a um, soldier and I have every confidence that me and my men will be able to to win this. And his his bluster is is not bluff, and he in fact uh, leads this this uh, famous assault on the Quihuilapan. I think I pronounced that right. I think I threw a few extra words in there. But anyway, but uh, he leads this uh, very famous assault, which leads him to gain a great deal of fame and recognition, and probably leads to his election as the Tlatelani of Tlatelolco just a few years later. But at the time, he also marries Ashiakat's sister. That's kind of like his reward. Like the the ruler of Tenochtitlan at the time, who was another uh, Motekazuma, um, Motekazuma the first, granted uh, Mokuiwish one of his daughters. So Ashiakat and Mokuiwish are now you know brothers-in-law. So again, it's a very incestuous kind of um, <laughs> a history. Okay, so everything's still being cemented through familial relationships. Is there still a great deal of uh, shared common ancestry between these two peoples? Is there still feelings left over from the wars against the Tepanex after this? Or 
how do the how do the uh, Tlatelolca feel about having this more influential neighbor still next to them? Well, here's where we start getting into sources talking about the Tlatelolca being jealous of the Tenochtitlan, jealous of their fame, and thinking, especially with this this very famous general who is now leaving their city, kind of thinking, well, why aren't we getting more of the shares of the conquest and the tribute? You know, why aren't we the ones who who are part of this, this grand alliance? Why are we subordinate? This is an independent city, but it's still subordinate to its neighbor. Mm-hmm. And so at this point, you start having uh, the sources say that uh, Mokwiwi starts to start to plot to overthrow and conquer Tenochtitlan. Then Tlatelolco will become the kind of the dominant Mexica city. And at this point, we really get into the actual the actual meat of of this uh, this war here there's a couple different versions about how this actually plays out because we are looking at people who wrote from a uh, mexica perspective but we're also looking at sources that wrote from a spanish perspective or sources that wrote from say a, a chalcan perspective which is another novel group so we if you have a version like uh, so if you have a, a book written by a guy named uh, Chimapahin, he has a much longer name, but he's known by Chimapahin, who was a, a, a Chalcan uh, man in kind of like the early 17th century. So, you know, about a, a hundred years or, or less after the after the, the conquest. And he wrote about this in kind of a more neutral way. But if you look at um, a, kind of one of his contemporaries, this guy named Fernando Te, uh, Fernando Tezozomoc, who, who was a descendant of the uh, Tenochtitlan uh, royal family, he writes about this from a much more kind of strident, um, you know, Tenochtitlan partisan way. So we, mm-hmm. we really have to kind of parse through the sources and, and see why this happened. But we do have a couple commonalities that, that kind of go through. The first is that there were really these kind of triggering events that, that brought everything to a head. So Mokwiwish at this time is kind of sending out feelers to other groups in the Valley of Mexico and outside the Valley of Mexico to be like, if I were to attack Tenochtitlan, would you assist me? Very, very subtle, maybe. Just, just, a, just a hypothetical. <laughs> I mean, that is, we don't actually have what they were saying. You know, we have a, a couple different versions of what these ambassadors would say, but it is this kind of feeling. Because like, remember, even though uh, Tenochtitlan is this powerful group that is on top, it doesn't mean that anybody likes them. <laughs> you know, people are just, the, the constant theme throughout Aztec history, not just Mexica history, but Aztec history, is if you turn away from your subordinate group for, for even a minute, they will betray you, stab you in the back, and then run away. Um, or, you know, or basically just stop paying you tribute, and then you'll have to fight a war to get them back into tributary and vote again. But, uh, <laughs> so, uh, he's rebuffed by a couple cities. So the, the core Aztec cities of uh, Texcoco and Tlacopan say, are, no way, are you crazy? Absolutely not. But the cities in kind of the southern area of the basin who had, you know, really had been resentful about the, the Mexica and, you know, kind of as this Aztec triple alliance dominance, they say, yeah, okay, we, we, can, we can be okay with this. You know, you attack and once you start attack, we'll join in. Um, similar with some groups outside the Valley of Mexico, like the, uh, like the Slash Calans, of course, who are the bitter enemies of the Aztecs, said, yeah, of course, you know, you attack and then we'll come join in. Yeah. So there's always these kind of vaguely empty promises i guess you could say like oh yeah you get it started and then we'll be right behind you sure uh, but one of the core things that we do see um, and this comes up again and again and again is that the city of Culhuacan um, says absolutely we will we will make the first strike with you but this is also not present in a lot of other sources and i i, I want to kind of come back to that but what, what i want to focus on now is some of the kind of trigger events that happened actually inside these two cities are you familiar um and i don't know if any of our listeners are familiar with uh, what's called the the criterion of embarrassment i don't think i am actually yeah it's this it's this biblical interpretation analysis kind of thing that says well clearly we can look at the bible and see historical events particularly in the, in the new testament because you know why would they write of you know why would the why would the people who are writing the bible have jesus be put up on a cross and you know stabbed in the side and basically you know why would they write all these embarrassing things about you know, about what happened to Jesus if it wasn't true? Mm-hmm. And we kind of have the same thing here, where even in the Tenochka sources, the Tenochka come off like a bunch of jerks. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, 
you know, we do have, you know, Mokui Weish doing this kind of plotting and, you know, looking for, for ways and alliances to overthrow the Tsunochka dominance. But the, the, the triggering events that we really see are uh, kind of, the, there's these two key events that happen. The first is that a group, uh, a group of uh, Tlatelokan women go into uh, Tenochtitlan, uh, to the market mm-hmm. there. And these uh, Tenochtitlan men offer to escort them back to Tlatelolco, and they say yes because these are these 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 young men are supposed to, uh, supposedly of you know of noble birth, so you know they should be you know should be fine you know. Um, but then these Tenochtitlan men take them uh, instead of taking them safely back to Tlatelolco, they rape them, and this is a this is a huge uh, uh, blight on the honor of Tenochtitlan. But even in the Tenochtitlan sources, they include this. And, of course, they don't exactly you know, play this up, but they, they certainly mean, like, yeah, okay, this happened. And the There's not much that, more they can say about it besides it just happened. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, okay. again, it's this thing of, like, you know, okay, well, why not paper that over? But uh, so we kind of think that, you know, this is a either, you know, we don't have a lot of specifics in these sources that we can really say that, you know, this specifically happened. And we can't say that this specifically happened as it's portrayed. Um, mm mm-hmm. But it is this kind of kind of criterion of embarrassment of saying there was definitely bad blood at the time. And the the, the second kind of event that happens is this destruction of of canal that uh, the Tlatelokans are building to to come into their city. And, and you know, remember these are cities that are built on a lake, and so both Tenochtitlan and uh, Tlatelolco are crisscrossed by canals. So uh, this canal that was being built was. Um, some of the some of the sources say it was it was already uh, it was already in use and it was a, a canal that connected to the main canal. Some of them would say that it was a new canal that was being built. Regardless, all the sources say that it was destroyed. Uh, it was overnight. It was blocked off and trash thrown in it and uh, it crumbled down. And the aqueduct that ran along it was destroyed. And, and obviously, sources... a, a very big thing for how uh, economically prosperous and how market involved the city was. Correct. That must have been a huge, huge hit. Yeah, precisely. So we have we had this idea that not only are the uh, Tenochtitlan basically treating the Tlatelolco, you know, personally, individually, as as nothing more than servants and slaves, but they're also attacking their livelihood. Mm-hmm. So at, at this point, we war is essentially inevitable. But there are still a few variations in who actually is pressing for this. So one of the things that you see in a lot of the Tenochtitlan sources is this guy called Tekonal. And Tekonal is usually portrayed as either a relative of Mokriwish or just another person who is kind of a high up no in the no, high up in the nobility. The problem is is that for a lot of the non Tenochtitlan or non Mexica sources, uh, Tekonal mm-hmm. doesn't exist. He's never mentioned. I'm going to put a pin on that and remember that for later. But there is this kind of uh, a little bit of confusion, well, not a little bit of confusion, a little bit of different in portrayal about who's pressing for war and who's not. But what we do have as, as this goes along is, is that Kuiwish is convinced that he needs to go to war. So he sends mm-hmm. out these emissaries to all these groups saying, okay, you ready? We're, we're going to war. And they say, oh, yeah, we're, we're totally ready. Totally, totally ready. Uh, and then because the Tlatelolco are outnumbered, he, uh, what he, what uh, Mokuiwish and Tekonal in some of the sort of sources say, uh, they start training uh, the men, uh, training the young men. So they, they bring them out and they hold, start holding contests. So they, they put up a stone statue and see who can, you know, sling the most stones at it the most accurately. Mm-hmm. They set up a wooden statue and they have, you know, archery contests with it. Uh, the most famous uh, example is usually the fact that uh, he would take the young men out into into the, the, the lakeside, the marshes, and they would have competitions to see who could shoot down flying waterfowl and birds and things like that. In uh, Diego Duran's uh, History of the, of the Indies, History of the Indies of New Spain, he, this is tied into this, this giant speech that Mokvi Wish says, saying that the Tenochtitlan, they're not as hard as wood or stone, and they're not as fast as the birds we've been shooting, and therefore, if we can destroy, you know, stone and wood and, and birds, um, clearly we can destroy them. So, <laughs> uh, but of course, this is all a very much an open, open secret at the time, you know. He yeah. has been sending out these, uh, these, these ambassadors to other cities, and he's kind of holding these, oh, yeah, no, totally not a training, military training exercise, pay no attention, we're just shooting down some birds. <laughs> just, just very casually, just, <laughs> oh, no, no, it's okay. We're, we're not training up for anything, it's just, it's just sport, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. 
Uh, so the Tsunotiko are very much watching this with, with a great deal of interest. And but the, the, the craziest thing, the craziest, craziest thing that happens actually involves this wife of Mokiwish. Remember, who is the sister of Ashiakat. And this, in some sources, even more than, than the rape of the Tzalat local women or the destruction of the canal, uh, the treatment of the wife of Mokiwish is the deciding factor as to why they went to war. I, you know, I would, of course, point to being the kind of political, economic-minded uh, um, theorist that I am. I would say that it comes down to essentially kind of a more a higher-level power struggle, but this whole sister of Ashikat, wife of Mokiwish angle is, is it's certainly a romantic thing, So, or <laughs> very much sure. not romantic. Plays better for the books, really. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so this wife, and her name is only given in a couple of sources, and in a lot of cases, again, with with women being kind of the the background radiation of of politics here, they, you know, it's it's there's not a whole lot of named women in in Aztec histories. Um, mm-hmm. But in a couple sources, her name is given as uh, Chachu Nanet, and that'll come <laughs> that'll come important in just a second. But the important thing <laughs> is that. Uh, Mokiwish mistreated her. And this is the story: is that he is, that he said she was uh, he called her ugly and that she was too skinny and that her breath stank. And these are these are literally things that he says about her in sources. That you know <laughs> these are literally criticisms that are come down to us centuries later. And that he put her aside and made her sleep in the corner while he you know gallivanted around with his concubines, um, which is. <laughs> And remember, this is the sister of the ruler, because Ashiakat is now the ruler of Tenochtitlan. This is the sister of the ruler of Tenochtitlan, so this is a huge political misstep and personal insult. So there's, there's this additional tension here, and then Chachiu Nanette has a dream. And in this dream, her, her vulva uh, speaks to her and, and pronounces words of woe. Um, so this is, the, this is the magical talking vagina of Aztec history. Uh, yeah, it's every, it's, every civilization should have one. Every it's, civilization it's a, needs to have one. Yeah, and you know, Aztec history is big on its omens. So, but in this case, this is this is a it is an ominous dream that she has. And the reason that I kind of look askance at the fact that her name that her name might have actually been Chalchiu Nanette is that Chalchiu Nanette literally translates as to um, uh, precious genitalia. So you just happen to have someone whose name is basically translates to his vajazzled whose uh, private parts <laughs> speaks an omen to her in a dream it's it's very coincidental at the least yeah uh, i would agree with that so but you know she has this she has this disturbing dream and she goes to mokuish and says look i i, I don't know what she, i don't know what's going to happen but you know i had this dream uh where where my where my genitals told me that bad been bad things were coming uh and mokuish is is disturbed by this so uh he he goes through and this is in this this story. The kind of the most complete version of the story is found in Duran. So I'm kind of pulling from there, but uh, other parts of it are told in other versions. But but Mo leaves a little bit disturbed. And as he walks out, he sees these other omens. He sees uh, a, a man talking to a dog and a dog talking back. Um, there's a boiling pot uh, next to uh, in, in next to a person in the kitchen, but instead of boiling water, it has dancing birds in it. There's a mask on the wall that starts speaking. So he sees all of these very very ominous omens, mm. and he wants to call off the attack. And this is why you don't see a lot of these kind of same omens in the non Mishika sources or the non Tenochka sources is because at this point in the Tenochka sources, Mokwiwish is urged by Teko now to, uh, to kind of, you know, put on his man pants and go, you know, and get back to you know, the business of war. Um, Teko now comes off as very much this kind of hot headed, fiery pro war, um, you know, this war hawk. He's very much a, a hawk. And Mokuish is a bit more kind of saying, well, maybe we don't have to, things like that. Mm-hmm. So uh, Mokuish to kind of see like, okay, well, let's let's see what's happening. Let's take a look and see what what's going on in Tenochtitlan. And so Mokuish sends spies out into Tenochtitlan to to basically kind of assess their, their military readiness. But a- again, this has been an open secret that Tlatelolco has been kind of uh, reaching out these feelers and kind of preparing for war for for you know some time now. Uh, and also, at this point, Ashikat's sister has come and told him about the dream. Or in some cases, the sister has has left Mokuish because of the, the horrible injustice he did to her. But anyway, uh, Ashikat has been well warned about this preparation for attack. So when he hears that, you know, some 
so I'm totally not spies, guys, uh, are coming into <laughs> Tenochtitlan, he gathers his nobles together and they just start playing a ball game. Just kind of, you know, hitting around a ball. Uh, just kind of chilling out, relaxing, having a nice day. And so these spies <laughs> go back to uh, Tlatelolco and to Tecanal and Mokbuish and say, yeah, they, they have no idea. Yeah, they, they're totally unprepared. They're just playing a ball game. They don't know what's going on. So obviously this seems like this is the right time for any kind of attack if you're going to do an attack when everybody's unaware and just kind of chilling out and playing uh, Aztec basketball. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so uh, who would expect that? Uh, you know, it's March Madness in Tenochtitlan. So uh, yeah, so Mokuish and Tekunao plan the attack and they, uh, and there's different, uh, there are of course different reports about when this attack happened. In some cases, the Tlatelolco attack at midnight and are repulsed. In other cases, they attack at dawn and they set up kind of a, a beachhead in, in Tenochtitlan. So, but regardless of uh, how the exact initial attack happens, what we do have that most sources agree on is that after, you know, kind of these initial skirmishes, there's a, there's a peace emissary that's sent, and it's sent from the Tenochtitlan to the Tlatelolco. And this, this one uh, Tenochtitlan noble goes to the uh, Tlatelolcans and says, let's, let's call a truce, let's call a peace. This, is, this, this doesn't need to happen. In some cases, this emissary is uh, killed on the spot by, uh, by the Tlatelolco. In other cases, he's sent, um, and, and this, my personal favorite version is he, he goes, he proposes peace, he's insulted, he's sent back to Tenochtitlan, uh, where then um, the, the Tenochtitlan officially say, okay, well, it's definitely on now, and send him back to officially declare war and demand the surrender of the Tlatelolcans, who then kill him uh, and throw his body in a ditch. So clearly, uh, there will be no peace. There was much killing of messengers to start off this war. So you, you, you have this initial attack, and you have the messengers being killed, and then obviously things are still on, things are progressing. So what are, are there any kind of major breakthroughs on either side? Do we have uh, raids within cities or any kind of more, uh, more broadly geographic skirmishes between allies? What what ends up happening after this this initial declaration of war and attack? What's really interesting about this is that if you recall back when you know we were talking about the Tepanax and we had some sources that say it lasted a couple months, some sources that said it lasted a year. Mm -hmm. For this, pretty much all the sources say that it was over incredibly quick because the because Tenochtitlan at this point was a much larger city than Tlatelolco, and so uh, Tlat uh, Tlatelolco was going to have to rely on their allies. But most of the allies that they had been able to kind of, you know, wrestle up were pretty far away. And because this attack happened kind of suddenly and kind of, you know, happened before everything was kind of in place, uh, those allies were still scrambling to, uh, to, to mobilize when most of the fighting was going on. So after kind of some initial uh, Tlatelokan success, what happens is that they are pushed back to the main uh, square, the main marketplace, which is also the place where the, the main temple is and the palace is there. It's, it's sometimes called the Royal Cold Quarter or the, the Noble Quarter or the Holy Quarter, depending on, depending on the, the source you're reading. But it's, it's, a, it's the core of any Aztec or Mesoamerican city. And so uh, the Tlatelokans are pushed back to that. At this point, um, we have some we we have a little bit of debate over whether there was uh, kind of another kind of lull in the fighting or whether this was uh, one attack that went all the way. But one commonality that we do have is that Mokriwish is pushed back up the main temple, um, fighting his way back up the main temple. But at the top, you know, kind of overwhelmed, uh, he, uh, he is slain. But at the same time. And this is, again is one of one of my favorite parts of weirdness in some of these these, these settings to help to kind of create a, a feint to allow them time to regroup. Ultimately, the group grouping didn't work, but um, to allow them the the plot to to retreat. There's the they they send out um, naked women uh, naked women and children, and the women <laughs> go out and slap their bellies and squirt milk out of their breasts at the Tenochka to distract them. And the children are their faces are blackened and they and they have uh, with with pitch, um, and they have feathers on their head, which uh, that's kind of uh, a, a traditional way of declaring war 
in uh, in this post classic period was to smear pitch on your on your enemy's face and then place feathers on it, kind of symbolizing. Um, it's a very complicated uh, symbology of death there. But so mm. he sends out children dressed in kind of declarations of war and women um, kind of personifying uh, motherhood to to distract the Tsunoshika. and it works, of course. The and the Slatsaloka are able to retreat up the the temple. So. Here we also have uh, a couple diversions uh, in in the way the stories are told. In Duran's version, Ashiakat himself goes up the temple, finds both uh, Mokuish and Tekunau praying before the altar of Huitzilopochtli, and kills them. You know, no problem. Um, mm. In other versions, like uh, in Torquemada, I believe it is just it, it's not said who who kills Ashiakat, uh, just that a Tenochka warriors go up there and fight him and kill him. In some other versions, like I believe uh, Clavajero, uh, I think might I might have this version. I might have to check. But uh, in some other versions, Mokuish goes up to the top of the temple, sees that he is defeated, and throws himself off it to his death. Regardless, what most of the sources agree with is that his body is taken back. Uh, Mokuish's body is taken back to Nanshilan, where it is where they go through the post mortem ritual sacrifice as though he was alive and then bury his body in full royal state um, burial in a way. Although in other cases, he's also just thrown in a ditch. Um, <laughs> those, are, those are two rather extremes, but so, somewhere in the middle or maybe more towards the, the royal, which, whichever, wh- which one would be probably more close, or is there any way of telling? Or is it somewhere a mesh of the two? So if you recall, I had said that there's a reason we might have Tekunal in some sources and not have him in other sources. And the reason that he exists in the more mashika oriented sources is because it gives Mokuiwish a way out. Particularly in, in the Mashika sources, we see uh, Mokuiwish having, being shown as this person who is being led astray by his, his bloodthirsty, dishonorable uh, advisor. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, in the non mashika sources, we see Mokri Wish as this person and Tekunal doesn't exist. So, and there's a reason for this because even though Tachaloka after this point was completely subordinate, completely subordinate to Tenoshi Lan at this point, to the point where it basically became just, just another neighborhood or group of neighborhoods within Tenoshi Lan, the, there was a, kind of a forming and a forging of a common Mashika identity after that. I, I kind of ironically, they were, they were less opposed now that the kind of matter, matter had been settled. And in particular, because Tlatelolco was actually the, the site of the last stand of the Mashika during the siege of Tenochtitlan, it gained him a, a lot of uh, prestige at that point as well. And so there is this idea of that, okay, we are, we are back again in Brothers at Arms. And so when we see Mokui Wish being portrayed as this honorable man who was led astray by an evil advisor, we can see that as a way of the Kashika, as they tell their own stories, of kind of adopting Mokui Wish into it and saying like, no, 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 he's one of us. He deserves the nobility he has. Really, it was this one jerk Teko now. So, so there's some kind of uh, reuniting over their shared Mashika uh, heritage after this event, correct? Yes, yeah. Uh, and particularly uh, in, in the reign of, uh, of Motoka Sumishoku uh the, the Montezuma who was ruling when, when Cortez showed up, there's, there's a, kind of an addendum to this story where uh, the Tlatelolca were again shamed because at this point, at the defeat of the Tlatelolca in this war, they have tribute burdens put in place. And these tribute burdens continued on for years and years, basically and until the until the Spanish showed up. And at one point, the Tlatelolco were not able to fulfill their tribute burden, and they were they had their rights and privileges revoked. And in another in another version, um, the Aztecs lose a war against Cholula, and or sorry, the the Tenochka lose a war against Cholula, uh, and the Tlatelolco kind of mock them for it, and they have their rights revoked. But anyway, there's this later, a few decades later, there's this part where tensions flare up again. And uh, the Tlatelolca have their rights revoked for, you know, rights to things like being able to wear sandals, being able to wear a certain uh, jewelry that signified you as noble, being able to enter the royal palace, being able to trade in the marketplace, things like that. But then the Tlatelolca, in kind of a referencing back, kind of going back to Mokuish, put together their forces for, for the next war and uh, lead, this, this, uh, lead this assault that leads to a victory, thereby kind of restoring their honor. But at, at this time, with the death of Mokuish, they're kind of, I mean, they're very defeated, 
And again, we actually do see this at this time, this reiteration of this common trope of uh, once you are defeated, you hide out in, in the lake amongst the waterfowl and the reeds. Because as the, uh, as the Chinochka forces move through the city, basically sacking it as they go, um, you know, mm. not a whole lot of quarter being given, uh, the uh, Tlatelica soldiers jump into the river to, you know, or jump into the lake to avoid being, being seen. Uh, and there's a, there's a great line in Duran uh, where he says, even today the Tlatelica are called quackers and imitators of waterfowl because of this one thing that happened. So <laughs> a, uh, a Tlatelica relative of Ashiakat approaches him as the sacking and burning and looting of the city is going on and says, please stop this, this savagery. And Ashikat agrees, and he says, okay, you know, I'll, I'll put an end to the sacking and the looting, and I'll let the soldiers come out of the marsh, but they have to quack like ducks before. So it's really just insult to injury fantastically. Wow, yeah. that's, that's absolutely, uh, that's one way to ensure that your tail is sufficiently between your legs. <laughs> yes, to, to make sure that you quack like a duck and then you can go back to, uh, you know, paying your tribute. So, yeah, at the end of this, you know, this very, very brief war, and in some, in some cases it's said to last basically like two days. In some cases it says, oh, it was like a week or two. Uh, to basically the, to the point where uh, the, these allies that the Tlatelic like had put together had no chance of ever actually coming to their aid. Um, some of the stories uh, actually have uh, Kulwakan, um, sending, you know, starting to send troops, getting there, realizing it was too late, and then turning around. Um, some of the so that brings they, up a good point. So what actually, what is actually the uh, the ramifications of this on these allies that uh, the Tlatelolca had put together? Yeah, so in some of these senses, uh, the, the ones that didn't actually get around to sending any, um, any troops, like, uh, like, the, like the city of Xochimilco or the city of Chalca, who had said, yeah, you start attacking and, we'll, and then we'll come to your aid, not, we don't really have too much said about what happened to them. And, and Chalca at this time was under kind of military rule itself, so kind of a moot point there. But in a lot of the sources, we do have the leader of Kulwakana at the time being, basically being, being killed. Uh, arrested and, and executed uh, for his role in aiding them. And, and actually, again, we don't actually see this too much in the, uh, the mexica oriented sources. We see this more in the non mexica oriented sources. Um, in the mexica oriented sources, this is really portrayed as a fight between brothers. In the non mexica sources, we see this portrayed as, okay, yeah, great, uh, Tenochtitlan is being, is being a dictator again. And so it emphasizes more the fact that it wasn't, in some sources, we don't just have the ruler of Kulakan, but also the ruler of some other cities that agreed to help being, you know, being executed as well. Are there any final thoughts or things you just want to put in there? Yeah, actually, I, I would just go back to my original point uh, about the fact that, you know, when we do talk, you know, it, we just went through a, a kind of a crash course in, uh, you know, in Mexica history, 200 years of Mexica history. It kind of culminated in this war, which is actually almost kind of an anticlimax in a way, because while it did establish this this single dominant Mexica state and forge their identities together in a way that they you know was no longer able for them to, to diverge, it's really it, it is overshadowed by this the, the conquest that happened you know, 50 years later. This 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 war that we talked about happened in the 1473 around that area, around that mm -hmm. time. But I, I just want to reemphasize again the point that. When we do think about the Aztecs and we do, when we do think about Mesoamerican history, we have to consider that they do have a history before the Spanish, that they were not simply there as this straw man to be burned down, this, this puppet to be knocked over by the Spanish, and that they, they themselves had a, a great deal of kind of their own internal politics and disputes and minor civil wars and, and you know, abused wives and women that led to important political ramifications. And when we look at how their history proceeded, and when we look at, in fact, at the, the very famous conquest, we, what we actually do see is a lot of those kind of internal fragmentations coming to the surface and leading to the fracturing of the political alliances that would allow the Spanish to actually uh, succeed because they are backed up by everyone except the Mexica. Thank you for uh, giving this, as you said, crash course in uh, Mexica history and uh the very, very thorough uh, look at the war that started with a ball game and ended with uh, quacking. I, I really do 
uh, appreciate you laying this out so nicely for everyone. And thank you, Mike, uh, for for, uh, letting me be the sounding board. And as always, thank you, the listener, for tuning in, subscribing, downloading, commenting, all those rating, reviewing, all those things that you do. Uh, you're, you're wonderful people, and we love you. We love you so much. But uh, I hope this episode brought home the idea that the, not only these people who we typically describe as or almost envision as not having a history, you know, these, these peoples and areas that are just kind of black spots when it comes to teaching history and learning history until you really delve deeply into these sources, that part of the problem, you know, part of the reason I can understand why people don't teach the history of these times is, is because the, the primary sources that we have are very kind of retrospective and biased and kind of wrapped up in, in telling a different narrative than what we think of as kind of, you know, the dry, rational, professional history that we see with the development of the, the modern historical academic profession. So I hope you felt that kind of a, you know, Rashomon of historical events running through this, this episode. Coming up in two weeks, uh, in the next Fortnite's episode, we will be talking to Caffarelli, or really we'll be listening to Caffarelli talk to us because she's recorded kind of a special guest episode where she'll kind of just be doing uh, flying solo and playing some recordings because we'll be talking about, uh, and we actually will be talking about it. I'll do a little Q&A with her at the end, but for the most part, the episode will be her talking, playing recordings of opera because she'll be talking about Alessandro Moreschi, who's sometimes known as the last castrato. During his life and career, and of course, because it is a <laughs> it is an episode about opera, she'll be playing a little bit, a little bit of recordings from him and a little bit of recordings from his contemporaries as well. To, to give you an idea about not just kind of the styles that they were singing in, but also a little bit of the recording limitations of the time. In the meantime, please do keep viewing us on iTunes or whatever podcasting or streaming service you use. Uh, if we're not on the podcast or streaming service you use, then please do let me know and I can add us, or you can, you know, a lot of services you can add us as well, uh, which we'd appreciate that. Uh, check out the YouTube page, come into the discussion posts and ask some follow up questions. Um, I, I do post those discussion posts, so even if you're asking questions like a couple of weeks after the episode is gone, I will forward them on to the the, the guest, uh, the guest interviewee, so they can come back and respond to you. And of course, recommend us to a few friends. And if you don't have a few friends, then just start recommending this podcast to people, and maybe you can make friends that way. But anyway, we'll see you in two weeks. You've been listening to the Ask Historians podcast. For more history like this, visit us at reddit.com slash r slash askhistorians and ask over a hundred historians and enthusiasts anything you want to know in history. Find us on Twitter as at askhistorians and subscribe to the show on iTunes. Or visit askhistorians.libsyn.com Thank you very much for listening and join us next time on the Ask Historians podcast.